I pulled up last Sunday and I saw three of our men standing outside joined together praying. And y'all don't know how much that blesses my heart to see that you have a heart for the things of God and for the move of God. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? God is looking for people that he can depend on, he can call upon at any time, day or night, because there's things going on in the earth and we've got to be a people on the cutting edge uh, that are saying, Lord, what's on your heart? What's on your mind? What do you need me to do today? How can I be a laborer together with you? You know, the Apostle Paul said we're laborers together with God. Y'all understand that, right? Because Jesus is the head and we are the body, then everything has to be done from the body. Everything flows from the head down, but the head by itself cannot accomplish anything in the earth. If you don't believe me, let me see you take your head off, sit it down in this chair and walk out. Your head tells your body what to do. Jesus, the head of the church, tells his body, the church, what to do. So we got to have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. we got to hear. we got to listen. And when the Bible says to have ears to hear, he's not talking about these things on the side of your head. He's talking about spiritual ears. Amen? And when he prays that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened, he's not talking about these natural eyes. He's talking about your spiritual eyes. Amen? I want to read something to you, and uh, before I do that, look with me in Exodus 33, and look in verse 16. We touched on this last week. I don't have a whole lot of time uh, to elaborate on this, but I told you that there is a rallying cry that must be our rallying cry in the days of head if we're going to see the glory of God. Moses asked the Lord, Wherein shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? Is it not in that you go with us? So shall we be separated, I and your people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, I want you to remember that word separated. So shall we be separated. The Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, I beseech thee, show me your glory. All week long, I've been saying to the Lord, Lord, I want to see your glory. Lord, show me your glory. Lord, show us at Faith Family Church your glory. Let us be one of the, the, the lights in the darkness of this world where your glory is is seen and felt and experienced and from here touch the lives of thousands, even millions of people. Amen. 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 But Moses said, how shall it, what's, how's it going to be known? How's everybody going to know that you are with us? And remember I told you that word separated. He said, we will be separated from everyone else. That word separated in the Hebrew, it means distinguished, marked out, set apart, severed, to put a difference. To put a difference. Go with me to Exodus, please, in chapter 8, and look at verse 22. I'm not going to take you through all of these, but I do want you to see that the same word that was used in Exodus 33, when Moses talked about being separated, is the same word that's translated sever or to make a difference, and many other things. But I'm just going to show you two or three places here. Remember when the people of Israel were in the land of Egypt. God had put them in the middle of Egypt, in a part or a suburb, you might say, of Egypt called Goshen. God told the Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Y'all remember, he would harden his heart. He would lie. He would say he was going to let them go. Then he wouldn't. He would renege. And so God started sending all these plagues. And he said, I will sever in that day the land of Goshen. Sever. Separate. That's that Hebrew word. I'm going to separate in that day the land of Goshen where the people of God live and which my people joy of. No swarms of flies shall be there. How would you like to live in a land where there's no flies? One of the plagues was flies. Now, I want you to imagine, imagine millions, millions, and millions of flies everywhere. It was a plague. But yet, there was a supernatural boundary 
around the land of Goshen where the millions of Israelites live, not one single fly could get through there. It was like an invisible shield. You hit it, bam, you're dead. No flies. Why? God severed. God separated them. God made a difference. Amen? To the end that you may know. Pharaoh, to the end that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Look at Exodus 9, verse 4. When the plague of the moraine that was killed the cattle in Egypt came, the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall nothing die of all that is in the children of Israel. I'm telling you, anybody who's got farm animals, you need to understand. If everybody else's herds, everybody else's animals around you is dying of sickness and disease, yours don't have to. God will make a difference. And he does make a difference. Amen? That's the reason we were not afraid of COVID-19. Because God makes a difference. Amen? Look again in uh, chapter 9, 26. I believe it's 9, 26. I might have written this down. Yeah, here it is. The plague of the hail. Only in the land of Goshen. Everybody say only in the land of Goshen. Y'all listen to me. No plague shall come near your dwelling. No plague shall come down my dwelling. Hallelujah. Only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were was there no hail. Hallelujah. <laughs> Chapter 11, verse 7. The final one was the death of the firstborn. I love this. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a, even a dog move his tongue against man or beast. I've been telling people for years to have a fear of dog. There's your scripture right there. You just say it out loud. Not a, never again will a dog raise his teeth against me or even move his tongue against me. That you may know how that the Lord does put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. You need to know that God makes a difference between his people, the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the rest of the world. Amen. So Moses wanted to know, how are they going to know that you are with us? What separates us? What severs us? What is the difference between us? And if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't send us. Amen? Amen? And then he says, show me your glory. And the Bible says that God showed him his goodness. Amen. You know, David was a man after God's own heart. Greatest king Israel ever had. Never been another one like him before or after. And he said, I would have slipped. My feet would have slipped. He said, I'd have been in a mess if I had failed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. A lot of people have no revelation of how good God is. Amen? Amen? But God showed him his glory when he prayed for his glory. Showed him his goodness. Folks, I want y'all to understand something. These days ahead, I'm going to be talking to you a lot about the glory of God. Because the glory of, the, of God is not exactly the same as the anointing. It doesn't work the same. A few minutes ago, if we were worshiping the Lord, I discovered many years ago that when my right hand begins to burn, the anointing is strong, the anointing is there. It is time right then, don't wait for people that need healing, deliverance or whatever. It is the anointing that destroys the yoke. It is not me. It is not any man. Amen. Without, apart from Christ, the anointed one, his anointing, I can do nothing and neither can you. But on the other hand, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ is not Jesus' last name. He is Jesus, the anointed one. That's what Christ means, the anointed one, the anointing. But when the glory comes, I want y'all to understand something. Brother Hagin used to talk to us constantly about the greater glory. The greater glory. He said he only knew of one church that he could go, that God could move how he wanted, when he wanted, the way he wanted. He said in all the years of his ministry, only one church that he knew of because they were that sensitive to the moving of the Spirit of God. I told you I wanted to read something to you. A prophecy that Brother Hagin, the Lord gave him, 
It's many, many pages long. I just wrote down the gist of a few things that I wanted. I felt like God wanted me to share with you. I started to share it last week, and I got two or three lines in it, and I, got, I forgot about it and because I got to talking about some other things. In the coming revival, there's going to be increased manifestations of the supernatural. How many of you will believe with me for increased manifestations of the supernatural? Now today, Ralph, don't let me forget to get back on this, okay? But listen to me carefully. If you'll read your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it tells us the nine manifestations of the Spirit. Three of them say something, tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. Three of them reveal things, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning the Spirit. Three of them actually do something. I mean, it's the special gift of faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healings. Those are the nine manifestations of the Spirit. And God does not want us to be ignorant of those things. He wrote to the church, and he said, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual things, of spiritual gifts, of the manifestations of the Spirit. And he said, the reason that I give these manifestations of the Spirit is to profit every man with all. That's King James. That means I give these manifestations to bless people, to benefit people, to help them. Amen? See, listen to me. If we don't preach it, if we don't believe for it, if we don't pray for it, if we don't expect it, we're not going to have it. Because like I've been telling you, the power of God is everywhere right now. The power of God is present everywhere, but that does not mean that it will automatically manifest everywhere. That it will only manifest where we want it to, where we pray for it and believe for it. He went on to say, the Lord said in this prophecy, the glory of God will come down upon whole congregations. The whole congregation. I am believing for the day when the glory of God will manifest as it did in the Old Testament, as it's done in many times in recent history. Listen to me. Upon whole congregation, the cloud, the glory of God will cover the entire congregation. When that happens, let me tell you something, folks. It's not the anointing at work anymore. When the glory of God comes like that, you're resting in God. And things just, bam, happen. Amen. Brother Hagin was in a meeting with another minister, and the one that had preached was talking about the need for unity in the body of Christ. I cannot say enough about unity. Let me show you something. Put up Psalm 133. How precious it is that brethren and sistern. Matter of fact, I wish it would have said cistern. I don't know if it's such a word as that. I know there's a C-I-S-T-E-R-N, but I've never seen a S-I-S-T-E-R-N. But if it's brethren, then it's got to be cistern, right? And most of the disunity usually comes from the cistern. Don't get mad at me now, because I'm telling the truth. I like what Brother Mark said about the Amplified Bible. It's a women's Bible, because it's got a lot more words in it. <laughs> and women use a lot more words. Proven fact, women use a lot more words than men do. Huh? Which means women talk a lot more than men do. And the more you talk, guess what? The more you're apt to say things you have no business saying. How many of you ladies want unity in your home? Amen. How many of you men want unity in your home? How many of you know that unity is precious? How good, how pleasant it is to dwell together in what? Unity. Look it up. The Hebrew word, one. Oneness. Oneness. Amen. When we got married, we became what? One. one flesh. God never intended for a man and woman to get married, dwell in the house together, go in two different directions. Anything, listen to me, with more than one head is a freak. There can only be one head of a home. There can only be one head of a church. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Everything flows from the head down. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the chief shepherd of the church. 
he places an under shepherd to oversee his flocks, right? And he wants every person to dwell together in unity. That means if we're going to have the manifestation of the Spirit of God, the way he wants to manifest himself, we've got to have unity. Amen? Amen. I said, we've got to have unity. Amen. I've heard of these people who live in the same house, husband and wife. One goes to a Pentecostal church and one goes to a non-Pentecostal church. Makes me want to say, how's that working for you? Wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall? In other words, you can't even talk about God in that home without having a fight. One believes in speaking in tongues, the other one doesn't. One believes in divine healing, the other one doesn't. One believes that what God wants you to be blessed and prosperous, and the other one thinks you should never talk about money at all. Amen? Do you want unity in the church? Do you want unity in your family? Amen. Then you're going to have to do some repenting. Amen. I do not say that jokingly. I do not say it lightly. God gives grants repentance to the hearts of people who are crying out to him, saying, Lord, I want unity. I want your glory. I want your power. I want to see the glory of God in our church. So, Brother Hagin and his other pastor was holding meetings together, and one of them gave him a message in tongues, the other gave the interpretation, and it was the Spirit of God was talking about the need for the church, the body of Christ, to be as one, to have unity. And he said, all of a sudden, Brother Hagin said, like a wind blew through the place, and he said, when that wind went through the place, suddenly, in a moment of time, he said every sinner was saved, every sick person was healed, every hungry believer got filled with the Holy Ghost. He said a woman who had been brought in on a stretcher in an ambulance, she had had six operations. The doctor said she had two months at best to live. She looked like death. Suddenly, she jumped up when the glory came in. She jumped up, ran around the church, totally healed. People got delivered. Listen to me, folks. We have to prepare for a greater measure of the glory of God. Amen. Hallelujah. It goes on to say, the glory of God will come down upon the whole congregation until the whole building will be filled with a glory cloud that many will be able to see. There will be people who fall under the power and will be unable to move for 10 or 12 hours. Be willing to let the Holy Spirit move and have his way in your services. Don't be afraid of fanaticism and excess. There are so many people that are so afraid that somebody's going to get out of line, but Dad Hagen always said, I'd rather have wildfire than no fire at all. Amen. Don't be concerned about the fanaticism, the excess. We will deal with it. Amen. Amen. Amen? Sometimes you just have to just overlook some things. Other times you have to address it. Amen? Folks, listen to me. When we first came here, I'm telling you, it seems like every demon in three counties showed up <laughs> to test us. We had some of the craziest stuff that happened. I mean, I had a man throw a crutch at me one night. Yeah, he was on a crutch. I didn't know who he was. And I'm standing there praying for people. He's standing back there. He literally threw the crutch at me. We had a family show up, filled up a whole row, and every one of them, they had these bags in their hand. I'm wondering, what in the world they got in those bags? Snakes? Thank God it wasn't snakes, but it's almost as bad. They had tambourines. And every one of them pulled a tambourine out. And it's hard for the praise and worship team to stay, you know, uh, keep things going right when everybody beating on the tambourines. <laughs> and I motioned for Brother Ralph, and I said, go around, tell the man on the end down there. It was obvious that he was in charge. I said, tell him, I said, uh, please tell everybody to put the tambourines up. We don't need that. 
And so in just a moment, he looked down the aisle, they put the tambourines up, and it wasn't long. The whole row got up and walked out. Never seen them before, never seen them again. And somebody asked me what was wrong with the tambourine. I said, nothing wrong with the tambourines itself. It's the principle of the thing. They were not submitted to any authority whatsoever. They thought they could walk in and do what they wanted to do, not submitted to any kind of authority whatsoever. I said, what if they'd have backed, backed up a pickup truck with a piano, opened those, four, those double doors, and just set a piano in? Same thing. Right? Now, there's got to be unity. And to have unity, you've got to be yielded to some authority in your life. Y'all, that's the reason there's so many church hoppers today. Because they don't want to submit to anybody. There's a lot of people, they just want to do their thing, be seen, be heard. They don't want to help. They don't want to be a blessing. They don't want to give their supply to the body. Amen? So that the body can grow up into the full measure of Christ. I had two guys, I had uh, been to a funeral, and they sang at a funeral, and I guess they must have saw me there. Because then right after that, they showed up at the church. Now, they, I'm not saying they couldn't sing good. They played guitar, they sang good. And um, I thought they did real well. They sang, you know, go high, rest high on the mountain at the funeral, you know. And... Uh, so they showed up over here at church one Sunday morning. After church, I spoke to them, shook the hand, and uh, one of them said, we'd like to sing. And I said, you would? He said, yeah, we'd like to sing. And I said, well, I said, uh, won't you just come to church for a while? We'll see how things go. He said, uh, no, I'd like to, we'd like to come back and sing like next Sunday. I said, not happening here because I don't know anything about those guys' lives. And I'm not about to allow them to transfer something from up here in the pulpit to this congregation because I'm responsible before the Lord. Y'all do understand that if you get the wrong people in the pulpit that are carrying demonic spirits, that is released into the congregation. I want the glory. I want the power of God. And there are some things that God requires of us that nobody is talking about anymore. Amen. He said, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Right. And somebody said, oh, wait a minute, Pastor, you're going to take away our makeup, <laughs> our jewelry? Has nothing to do with holiness. Right. How long your dress is or your hair has nothing to do with holiness. Right. Holiness is loving what God loves. Amen. Be you holy, for it's written, I am holy. He's a holy God. You ought to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Amen. And how many know that God loves unity? Amen. Huh? Amen. But he hates divorce, the Bible says. How many know that God hates strife and envy and division? Amen. So you've got to strive for unity. You've got to strive for it. If you didn't have to strive for it, the Bible wouldn't have told you to do so. Why? Because the devil loves division. Oh, he, he wants there to be strife. He wants everybody to be gossiping and, and, you know, voicing their opinion about everything. Yeah. You know, people go out and they'll complain about the children's ministry. Well, when's the last time you got involved with the children's ministry? The people who talk about it are the people that don't do anything. The people who talk about me preaching that God wants to bless you financially are the ones that don't tithe and don't give. Because the ones who heard the word and believed the word and acted on the word, they are now recipients of that word, walking in the blessing of God, and glad they did. Do you want the glory or not? Hallelujah. Say it out loud. Say, Lord, Lord show, me your glory. show me your glory. I purpose in my heart, in my heart to have unity, have unity in, my home, in my home and in my church. In, my church. in, Jesus, name. in Jesus' name. Let me tell you something. Anything that doesn't look like, look like unity, you ought to shut it down. Amen. 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 Just shut it down. 
I wouldn't even pay no talking about this. Let's read this prophecy. Okay? So, be willing to let the Holy Spirit move and have his way. Don't be afraid of fanaticism and excess. Encourage and invite the Holy Spirit to manifest himself, and he will. Amen. Let's do that right now. Oh, Holy Spirit, we invite you. We encourage you to manifest yourself. We want you to come in our midst that people will be helped and blessed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And the glory of the Lord shall rest upon his saints. The cloud of glory will envelop many. The eyes of many will be open, and they will see into the realm of the Spirit. Many will say, I saw a cloud hanging over the minister. Hanging over the minister's head as he preached. Others will say, the preacher stood in that cloud as he ministered. Others will say, I saw Jesus standing beside him. Folks, oh, how, oh, how we need the glory. Oh, how your family needs it. Amen. You know, as a pastor, and, and of course, I know y'all know that the word pastor, poimen in the Greek literally means a shepherd, right? And we know that the Lord is our shepherd. And because he's our shepherd, we shall not want, we shall not lack, right? But the Bible tells us that he said, I will give you shepherds. I will give you pastors, shepherds that will feed you. And you won't have any fear. And you won't be experiencing lack. But he's talking about people who come and drink and eat of the fountain of life. But folks, listen to me. You can't make people do something just because you want them to do it. I told you last Sunday. I want every single man, woman, boy, and girl who calls us their pastor, who claims faith family church as their home church, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And God began to talk to me about the fact that there's gaps in people's spiritual growth. Years ago, when we started our Christian school here, we don't have any more, the grace lifted and we knew it was time. A prophetess actually confirmed that to my wife because the grace had lifted off of her and we no longer had the school. But when we had this school, the curriculum that we used, the first thing, when a new student would show up, she gave them a test, and that test, and but this thing worked. I mean, it really worked. It revealed the gaps in their education. In other words, there was a certain school, and I won't call any names because we have people come from all three counties and schools everywhere, but there was a certain school, a certain age of child, every single one that came to us, they had a gap in their... They couldn't subtract. Couldn't subtract. I'm talking about little children now. that should have been able to subtract. They could add, they knew other things, but they couldn't subtract. That was a gap. You with me so far? There are people who have gaps in their faith. Paul, in writing to one of the churches, he said, I am writing to you, I want to perfect that which is lacking in your faith. There are people who have gaps in their spiritual learning, in their spiritual growth. There are people because they missed certain steps of experience they are now regretting it and don't even know why they're not experiencing certain things in their life. Now, I want to listen to me carefully. And I know we have, don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to try to do this quickly. And then we'll pick up on it later. I didn't grow up in church. I knew nothing about God. I got born again. I left home when I was 17. I got born again, Lebanon Baptist Church in South Georgia. Just out of town, Abbeville, Georgia. Little country Baptist church I got born again. Was it long? Somewhere, you know, within a year or so. I had a vision. In the vision, I saw myself preaching. Do y'all remember I told you? I was in a dungeon, a completely circular room. People with, had chains on the hands and their feet. I was standing with a Bible, and I would preach to one till the chains would fall off. Some would just lift their hands and worship God. Others would fall down on their knees, you know, and, and begin to praise him. 
And I did that until every one of them was set free. That's when God called me to preach. And as I'm reading my Bible and I'm studying, I told y'all, my pastor and other ministers that I would go to could not answer my questions. I had questioned, why don't we lay hands on the sick and they're healed? Because the Bible says that any sick man, let him call the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. I said, Jesus said, these signs are part of those that believe. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. One way, not the only way, that God heals the sick is through the laying on of hands. Sometimes it's through anointing with oil. Sometimes it's just a spoken word, right? And so I had questions. What is this Acts 2 for? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues. Oh, that's of the devil. Well, Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues with more, than, more than you all. And do not forbid people to speak in tongues, but to do all things decently in order. And they just turn around and walk off because they knew I got them trapped now. I want answers. I'm not there to debate. I'm not there to argue. I want answers. And what happened? God spoke to me. Hook your TV and tell it to the back of your stereo. I did. Turned it on. Heard Reverend Kenneth e. Hagin for the first time in my life talking about the authority of the believer. And now through his teaching, because Jesus had appeared to him and said, go teach my people faith. God supernaturally connected me with this man of God who was a prophet of the Lord, I began to listen to his teaching, read his books, and I got the answers that I was looking for. I wanted to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That was the next step in my spiritual progression. Many of you sitting here, you've been saved 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. You never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God wants you to. Even his own disciples, Jesus had breathed on them and said, receive eternal life. Receive the life of God. But yet he said, now, tear in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. He said, because you shall receive power after that. Everybody say, after that. After that. He didn't say after you're born again. You understand the difference between the spirit within and the spirit upon? You'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. In Acts 2, the Holy Ghost came, filled the room where they were sitting, sat upon every one of them with tongues of fire, and they began to speak as the Spirit gave the utterance. Right? Amen. Now, we try to watch this. So I said, Lord, I want to receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I met some guys I worked with, and they were a part of a denomination called Holiness Baptist. I don't know if there's any around here anywhere that I know of, but there were several in South Georgia. And there were a group of people who had got kicked out of the Baptist church years and years ago for preaching certain things that, you know, that didn't agree with the doctrine. And so they had started this denomination called Holiness Baptist. And they were having a revival. It had started in one church it had grown, moved to a bigger church, had outgrown that one, moved to the biggest church they had. Finally, outgrowing that, after about eight or nine weeks of this revival, they had a campground near Douglas, Georgia. And one of them invited me to come because he knew I wanted to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And so I go. Now, I didn't know anything about these people. I found out later they're good people. They love God. They've got some truths. But how many of you know nobody has all truth, Right? They believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They believed in healing. They just didn't know how to help people to receive. And so I go, and the place is packed, and there's over a 1,000 people there. I'm on the back row. It's winter time. It's hot, hot in the place. And for some reason, I don't know how the word got out. I, I guess that friend of mine must have told the leadership there. They found out there was a Baptist preacher in the house wanting to get filled with the Holy Ghost, and they went nuts. Man, they call me down to the front, and they're hollering and screaming, and they're telling me, do this, do that, take off that, and put on this, and, you know, turn loose, let go. <laughs> so after about an hour of all that, yeah, after about an hour of all that, I'm just soaking wet and walked out in that cold winter air, got up the next morning, had a sore throat, and that's the only thing I got out of it. <laughs> but then the Lord spoke to me because I got quiet. And the Lord spoke to me, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. Is it Luke eleven thirteen 13 or Luke 13, 11? If you then, being evil, 
If you're being earthly here on this earth, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that what? You ain't got to work for it. It's for you and your children to all that are far off, the Bible said. This baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everybody. Amen? How many of you want some power in your life? Come on, guys. God wants you to have power at home, at work, on vacation, no matter where you are. He wants you to have power in your life. So then somebody like old Big Mike at work turned around and said to me, I got a headache. I said, be healed in Jesus' name. About knocked him out right there on the work floor. He's lifting his hands and it's gone, it's gone. He had a migraine. That's power. Amen. 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 I'm talking about the progression of how the Holy Spirit was leading me. And I saw it. All I got to do is ask. And then he said, look at Mark eleven twenty four, 24. And what things? Everybody say, what things? What things? Soever. Anything whatsoever you desire. I desire the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When you pray. Everybody say when you pray. Everybody say the moment you pray. Y'all got that? This is the prayer of faith. There are many kinds of prayer. And we're praying about and trying to figure out with the help of the Holy Spirit how that we can do more teaching on prayer and get you to learn how to flow with the Holy Spirit in prayer. I mean, there's all kinds of different prayers. All right? Prayer of agreement, intercession, on and on. Prayer of supplication. But this prayer here is the prayer of faith. Faith begins where the will of God is known. I knew it was God's will for me to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Even though everybody was telling me that's in the past, religion relegates everything to the past or to the future. And that's what everybody was telling me. That's of the devil. That's of the past. God did that just for the apostles, and I proved all that wrong with the Bible. <laughs> Through the word of God, listen to me, faith was in my heart now. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith begins with the will of God is known. I knew it was God's will now for me to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and he said, all you got to do is ask. How much more would the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And so how do you ask? He showed me these two verses. When you pray, Believe that you received them, and you shall have them. you got to believe that you got it before you get it. Abraham believed God according as it was spoken to him. And he started giving God the glory before she was pregnant, before Sarah was pregnant. While they were past, listen to me, he didn't consider his own body now dead or the deadness of Sarah's womb. All he considered what God said. And God said, I have made you the father of nations. I have made her the mother of princes. Now, don't call yourself Ab Abram or Sarah anymore. Call yourself Abraham and Sarah. Call the things that be not as though they were. Call yourself a father of nations. Call her the mother of princes. When there was no physical proof whatsoever. Don't y'all understand? It made him look like an idiot. Walking around saying... I am the father of nations. Because every time he said, I'm Abraham, that's what they heard him say. You've got to understand how the Hebrew language works. <coughs> every time he said, my name is Abraham, they heard him say, I am the father of nations. They're looking at this old man who's 99, his wife is 89, and they're thinking, yeah, he's losing it. We need to put him at home somewhere by now. But the Bible said he was called to the things that be not as though they were. So you know what I did? I went in my bedroom, shut that door. I got down on my knees. I said, Father, I believe your word is true. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I am a child of God. I've been born again, washed in the blood. I want this power that you promised that would come upon everyone when they received the Holy Ghost. And so I ask you now to fill me with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I believe I receive, because I know it's your will, and I know you're not a man that you should lie. Come on, y'all. And I thank you that I now received the Holy Ghost, got up, went my way. You say, what happened? Nothing that you could feel or see. Even when you don't feel it, it's working. Even when you don't see it, it's working. Amen. So I go back to work, and my Pentecostal brother said, have you received the Holy Ghost yet? I said, I sure have. 
They said, you speak in tongues? I said, not yet. They said, well, you don't have it. I said, oh, yeah, I have. I said, because what you don't understand is how faith works. I said, but that's the reason so many of y'all have been tarrying for 40 years and still ain't got it. Because God never said you got to tarry anymore. That first bunch had to tarry until the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, listen to me, that's when the Holy Ghost came. And he had never left. He's still here. And he wants to fill you with power to cast out devils, to heal the sick. Amen? Power to be a witness for him. And so I just started thanking God, like Abraham, giving glory to God. Thank you, Father. I received the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Lord, for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I received the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And so one night, not long after that, I'm going home for second shift. It's about midnight. I got an eight-track tape player in my old pickup truck. I got my Dallas home and praise eight-track stuck in. I'm driving down the road about 30 minutes home, you know, and uh, late at night out there by myself. And I would listen to that, you know, music, and I would worship and praise God. How many of you remember that Jesus said in John 7, put John 7, 37 up, on that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, if any man thirst. Listen, y'all, I was thirsty. Yeah. Amen? Amen? He said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and what? Drink. Let me tell you something, folks. You can't drink with your mouth shut. Shut. You got to open your mouth if you're going to drink. Come on now. And let me tell you something. The Holy Ghost doesn't speak. He doesn't do the speaking. You speak. He gives you the utterance. But you got to believe and receive. And you got to say, I've got the Holy Ghost because I've already prayed and believed I received. Amen. There was a man who came. He'd been a, a denominational church all his life. He was in his 50s. He started hearing this teaching, and so he came up one night and laid hands on him, and nothing in the natural happened right then, but they came back a week, a couple weeks later, and his wife told me, she said, I woke up in the middle of the night, he's on his knees in the middle of the bed with his hands lifted and speaking in tongues. Amen. Now watch, next verse, he that believeth on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow what? Say rivers, rivers, not just one, rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe, how many believe? Yeah. Yes. Which they that believe should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. But once the Holy Ghost was given, listen to me, when you pray, believe you receive, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So that night going home, driving down the road, one hand on the wheel, one hand just worshiping, praising God, listening to Dallas home and praise, all of a sudden, something way on the inside of me began to bubble. Come on, y'all. I'm telling you, something began to bubble up on the inside of me, and all of a sudden, I gave voice to what was on the inside. I started speaking in tongues. I've been speaking in tongues ever since praying out the plans and the purposes of God for our life, our family, our ministry. It's not given to you just to run around the church and look like a fool. Right. There's too many people that have made Pentecostals look like backwood imbeciles that don't have a bit of sense or no education. But I'm telling you all right now, the poorest man and the richest man needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You talking about power. You talking about having direct line to heaven? Oh my goodness. Thank you, Lord. God is good, isn't he? Are oh, we gonna get back on this? Because I want you to be convinced from the word. And I'm going to take you from the day of Pentecost to present time, and I want you to see the various outpourings of the Spirit of God, how often this has happened. Even though the devil's done everything he can to snuff it out, the devil doesn't want you filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Y'all with me now? The devil doesn't want you filled. You say, well, pastor, I got filled 20 years ago. You know, I spoke in tongue one time. Well, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. Y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? God wants you 
walking and living in the spirit every day of your life. Every day. Is there anybody here hungry for more? Amen. Remember I told you last week, that's one of the requirements. You've got to be hungry. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Amen. They shall be filled. Yes. You've got to be hungry. You see, folks, I was hungry. I had many other people that I knew, my age, saved around the same time I was. Most of them are dead now. You know why? Because they turned away from what I'm telling you right now. They were not hungry for more of God. And I know that every family in this church needs more of God in their family. You need more of God in your marriage. You need more of God in your children. God never intended for your children to grow up and to go crazy out there in the world. God never intended for your teenagers to be having sex and using drugs and drinking alcohol and running with a wild crowd. And some of you are thinking, well, but it's too late, Pastor. It's never too late for God. It's never too late for God. Remember what Jesus told Mary and Martha when Lazarus had been dead four days? Did I not tell you that if you would believe that you would see the glory of God? Oh, they saw it when his brother, their brother was raised up after being dead four days. Let's worship the Lord for a moment. Father, we're so thankful. For your goodness. We thank you for the glory. Lord, we invite and encourage the Spirit of God to move in our lives and in this place, Lord. Father, we pray for the body of Christ. Every denomination, every church, no matter where it may be. I pray, Father God, that you would grant to each and every believer the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That they may know the hope of his calling that they may know, Father God, the inheritance of the saints, that they may know the exceeding greatness of your power to us who believe, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And I pray, Father God, that the people of Faith Family Church, Lord, would have a hunger. Father God, that you would grant a hunger into their hearts. Lord, that they'll not find rest and peace until they're pressing on in for more of you, more of you. Open their eyes, show them, Lord. Give them the revelation of what I'm saying. Because I believe, Lord, with all my heart, in this time that we're living in, that the church must be filled with power to stand against the darkness of this world. I praise you, Lord, for your goodness. I praise you, Father God. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want to ask you just to bow your heads for a moment. If you're not born again and you say, I want to be saved today, I want to rededicate my life. I want to come back to God. Maybe you're watching online because there is no distance in prayer. The power of God is with you whether you're in the car, at home, vacation, work, no matter where. And if you'll invite him and want him to, his power will manifest in your life to save, to restore what has been lost. Is anybody here? Because we're going to pray out loud. I'm not going to ask you to come down here. We're going to pray together out loud as a congregation and right where you're sitting. You can pray and receive Christ as your Savior. You can repent of sin and come back to the Lord. Is anybody at all? You say, today's my day. Lift your hand. Is that you? Just lift your hand. You say, I'm coming home, Lord. I'm coming to you, Lord. I want to be saved. I want everything you have for me, Lord. Is there anybody here you say, Pastor, I've been born again. I love the Lord. I know I'm right with God, but I've not yet been filled with power. Now, I'm not going to ask you to come down right now. I want you to be thinking about it. I want you to be preparing. I want you to release your faith. As a matter of fact, if there's anybody here, you say, that is one of the gaps that I've got in my spiritual experience. I have never been filled with the Holy Ghost, and I want this power. Well, all week long, every time you think about it, release your faith and begin to say, next week, when hands are laid on me, next week, next Sunday, when pastor gives an altar call, I'm going to go down. When hands are laid on me, I'm going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You may say, well, I need, 
a fresh anointing. David said, Thou anoint my head with fresh oil. Oil is symbolic of the Holy Ghost. Same thing, just release your faith. I'm going forward. With hands laid on me, I'm going to receive a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, lift your hand. Anybody here, you say, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I see that hand. Yes, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Thank God. Anybody else? You say, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want this power in my life. Folks, you need it. You might not realize it, but you need it. You need this power. Because everywhere you go, I, I think I'm going to get uh, Holly and Kelly to testify. I want them to tell about one day when they encountered a woman that was demon-possessed. Had they not had power in their life, they wouldn't have known what to do. God is a good God and He loves you. And He wants to prepare you for everything that's ahead. Amen? Now, if you would, pray this prayer out loud. Lord God, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe He died and rose from the dead. I believe He is alive, seated at your right hand. And this day, I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I receive you, Lord. I dedicate my life to you. I give you my all. By grace through faith, I am now saved. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.